invite you to turn your Bibles to uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, very familiar text. We'll be working on this for a few weeks, but um, beginning in chapter 1, or chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 10. Here's the text, but now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of, fle of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? We've tried um, asking the question, are you a Christian? That was kind of vague. I mean, some people believe themselves to be a Christian because they were born in the United States. Others believe themselves to be Christians because they aren't Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist. So we tried another statement, are you an evangelical Christian? Well, that was better, but it was still sort of painting with a broad brush with little definition of what evangelical actually was. So we tried this, are you a born-again evangelical Christian? That was probably a little better, maybe, but it also created a great deal of confusion, especially with a lot of um, books being written, how you can be born again, suggesting various steps required, and it was, it was a familiar title, but a confusing concept, but it doesn't need to be. Actually, the origin of the confusion was a meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee who served on the Sanhedrin, which was a very powerful religious ruling body of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night. He was confused. He was wanting some answers. And what he got was really more than he bargained for. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Let me remind you of John's purpose in writing these events of the life of Jesus. He began with a thesis statement in the first 18 verses of chapter 1 where he basically was declaring this. Jesus is God in human flesh. I'm going to say that every week for the next 30 weeks or so. Or however long it takes. Maybe not that long. Um, but however long it takes us to go through the book of John, we're, we're going to talk about that. That's what the book is about. Jesus is God in human flesh. Now, in, in, what John wants to do is he, not only, he sets that up as a thesis, and then he takes the whole book of John, and he shows us time and again that Jesus is God in human flesh. And then when he gets to the end of the book, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, things he included, so that, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, God in human flesh, and that by believing, you may have life through his name. So it's not just, let me show you who Jesus is. Oh, great, he's God in human flesh. Enough. That's it. Okay. No, so that you might believe that he is that, and so that you might have life in his name. So this is going someplace. It's moving in the direction of saying, this is who Jesus is, and if we believe in him, we have eternal life. That's the point, what John was saying. And that brings us to where we are today in John chapter 3, because a guy came to Jesus, and he wants to know some things, and Jesus is going to tell him what he needs to do, if you will, or what he needs to believe in order to have eternal life. For those of you kids today who have activity sheets and you, you have the opportunity to listen for three mystery words today, Jesus said that it was necessary to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And in order to be born again, 
Jesus made a rather strange statement. He said that you had to be born of two things. What are those two things? Now, to show people um, how people are born again, Jesus used an illustration. And he uses this illustration to describe where it comes from and where it goes. I want to know what that illustration is. Okay? So at the end of the service, when you bring your little yellow sheets to me and you want something from the basket, I need to know two things that he said about what has to happen to be born again, and I need to know what illustration he used to show what it means to be born again. All right? All right, let's start out, and let's talk about... When Jesus is referring to the entrance, entrance to the kingdom, he tells us that there's only one entrance, and that is to be born again. So our consideration begins with what amounted to some religious confusion. Last week I told you that verses 23 to 25 of chapter 2 actually set up John chapter 3. Many believed in Jesus because of the signs that he did, but they were, they were not genuine. They, they were merely temporary followers of Jesus, but they really weren't believers in Jesus per se. They, they, they watched him, they saw the signs, they were impressed by that, and so they followed him for a while, but they weren't really genuine. And Jesus knew what was in them. Whatever else they might have been, they were not born again. One of, one of those who was impressed was Nicodemus. This guy was an important person in the religious community. He was very religious, but I think he was also very worried. There was something about Jesus that was different, something about Jesus that was magnetic, something about Jesus that was also confusing. So one night he came to Jesus to ask a question. He begins by, by addressing Jesus with a formal title. He called him a rabbi, which means teacher. Now, Nicodemus was a teacher of the people of Israel. He was a rabbi. He had been called rabbi all of his adult life. So here he is looking at Jesus, and he sees Jesus at least as a colleague, if not a superior to himself, and he addresses him that way. Um, and so... Um, He's at least suggesting that Jesus is, in some sense, a teacher and apparently a God-sent teacher. Or that's why how he refers to him. And that's pretty impressive coming from a Pharisee. Maybe Nicodemus thought that Jesus actually could be the Messiah, but he wasn't really sure. And he wasn't really sure... Um, if he had it all together, in other words, Nicodemus was not certain if he was, in fact, ready or prepared to meet God. And for some reason, he thought maybe Jesus might be able to help him with that, and so he goes. He was confused, and his confusion would grow um, as Jesus offered to him a regeneration explanation. Jesus doesn't acknowledge the accolades from the nighttime guest, he simply makes a bold statement, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I don't think Nicodemus saw that one coming. He heard what Jesus said, but he didn't know what Jesus meant. Jesus was telling Nicodemus what he needed was to be regenerated. He needed to be born again, or it could be translated born anew, or born from above. Whatever else Nicodemus may have done or said or understood, what he needed was a whole new beginning. There was nothing in Nicodemus that was worth salvaging. If Nicodemus wanted to see the kingdom of God, he would have to be born again. It was as simple as that. Now, we might say we get it, but Nicodemus had no clue. He didn't know what Jesus was talking about. I wonder maybe if, if Nicodemus thought, after he said to Jesus, and, and referred to him as a rabbi and so forth, he might have thought that Jesus would have immediately said, oh, thank you for acknowledging that and uh, appreciate that, and they had a little, you know, little uh, chat there together. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't even acknowledge what Nicodemus says. He simply says that he has to be born again. To quote John MacArthur uh, out of... Uh, sermon that MacArthur preached on this subject. He said, regeneration is a divine miracle that happens from heaven. 
Nicodemus has physical life. He doesn't contribute to it. He has no spiritual life. He needs it. But he can't contribute to that either because it's a work of God that comes only to those who cease trusting in themselves. In divine majesty, with one glorious stroke, Jesus obliterates all of the sinner's refuge, all of the sinner's safety in traditionalism, formalism, ceremonialism, legalism, ritualism, ecclesiasticism, and points the barbed arrow of spiritual truth at the vital point. You have to discount all of that. You need to be born again. As soon as Jesus made the point, I think what happens is Nicodemus balks. Here's the problem. Not only do you, must you be born again, Jesus is saying, but in essence he's saying you can't. You can't. Let's make some observations. Nicodemus didn't immediately start with, but wait a minute, but it's implied in the text, I think. Nicodemus doesn't say it, but at least it's recorded here, or uh, the implication. He was, very, he was a very important guy. He was a religious leader. I think he expected something more from Jesus. And Jesus doesn't give him anything. And so when Jesus says, you must be born again, what was his, what was his response? How can that be? How can you be born again? I mean, and then he even asked the physiological question, how that would be possible. Now, some think Nicodemus was being sarcastic. It's possible. Oh, yeah, we well, have to enter a second time in mother's womb, be born. Yeah. I don't think that was what he was doing. I don't see that. I think he was stunned that Jesus was saying what he said because I think that basically what was happening is Nicodemus had something on his mind in reference to the kingdom of God. In other words, Nicodemus is coming to Jesus, and he's a Pharisee. He's doing all the stuff that Pharisees were supposed to do, and then some. He's, he's doing all these things, but somehow he feels like maybe there's something else that needs to be done. And so he's asking Jesus that question. He's being a little bit vague about it, but he's a little bit concerned about the kingdom of God. And then Jesus makes this statement, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And he's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. How did he know that? I think that was going, what was going on in his mind. And, and he's still trying to figure this out, what he can do. Can he enter a second time and into his mother's womb? He's still working on the what can I do thing. But just as he had nothing to do with his own physical birth, so he had nothing to do with his spiritual birth. It all seemed impossible and confusing, so Jesus begins to unfold to the teacher of Israel what it takes to enter the kingdom of God. And so he says, unless, and here it comes, here's the statement we need to get. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Those two things. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about new birth, and there's a lot of ink that's been spilt on what is this water and spirit stuff. Some have made the case that to be born of water is physical birth, and to be born of the spirit is spiritual birth. And so Jesus was saying, unless you're born first physically, and then you're born spiritually, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and the, the water, you know, the, the fluid, the, the water breaking, and all that stuff, and I don't think Jesus was talking about that at all. And first of all, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, of course you're born physically first. Why would he say that if that's what that meant? And that wasn't a terminology that was used anywhere written down in the first century. So I don't know why that would be the case. There are others who think, well, water, if the Bible ever talks about water, it must be what? Baptism. So was Jesus saying, unless you are born, unless you are baptized and born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven? He isn't saying that either. It's nowhere in the context. It has nothing to do with what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Okay, time out. Who is Nicodemus again? 
He's a Pharisee. He is a ruler of the Jews. He is a scholar in the Old Testament. He understands the Old Testament. So Jesus gives him some Old Testament. Here's what he's saying. Let me quote from a passage that he would be familiar with. Ezekiel 36. Therefore, says, uh, therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. How does he do that? I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into my land. I will sprinkle you with clean water. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave you to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. When Jesus said, unless you are Let's just read the text. Um, Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling them that they have to be cleansed from their sin. And the Spirit has to do something in their heart in order for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus would have known that passage. Jesus is telling the teacher of the law, your whole system has a glaring hole in it. You can't get from flesh to spirit. He said something about spiritual birth. That which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus is telling the teacher of the law, the stuff you do is of the flesh. And that just produces more stuff of the flesh. You can't go from flesh to spirit. Something else has to change. You have to be born of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. So Nicodemus, how can you be a teacher of Israel and not know that? It's all over the Old Testament. That's why Jesus said, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So he's saying to Nicodemus, Don't you get it? You can't do something to get there. It has to be something that God does in you, and it involves his work of cleansing and putting his spirit in you. All right, here's the solution. Let's go back to water and spirit for a minute. There must be a cleansing and there must be spiritual birth initiated by the Holy Spirit of God. Here's another MacArthur quote. Salvation is a sovereign act of God by grace that he does independent of any action on the part of man. Man needs a complete spiritual birth. He needs to be washed. He needs to be transformed. He needs to have his heart replaced with a new heart. His spirit replaced with a new spirit. And he needs the Holy Spirit planted within him if he's going to enter the kingdom of God. And that's not something he can do because he's of the flesh. And flesh produces only flesh. So Nicodemus, how can you be a teacher of Israel and not know this? He didn't. Jesus didn't let him off the hook, so he says in verse 7, don't be amazed. Why would you be amazed if I said to you, now he gets to the second person, you must be born again. You're not going to the kingdom unless this happens to you, and you can't make a contribution because your flesh and flesh can't do this. End quote. So how does it happen? And that's when Jesus uses this very intriguing illustration. He uses the illustration of the wind. What is the wind? Well, the wind is invisible. 
The wind is uncontrollable, it's irresistible, it's unpredictable, it cannot be summoned, it doesn't show up because you want it, it doesn't go away because you'd like to get rid of it. Yesterday I went to a soccer game, one of my grandchildren, and watching the soccer game in Kenosha in the afternoon yesterday, the wind was howling at about 30 miles an hour or something and I'm sitting there and it's coming right at me and I'm thinking I wish the wind would go away and you know what it didn't I had a blanket over my head and the wind's coming in it looked like a you know looked like a monster sitting there I don't know how the wind works but I don't know how the gospel works either we keep sharing the gospel to everyone who will listen even to those who, will not, who, who try not to listen. And the wind of the gospel keeps blowing and suddenly without warning it finds its way into a fleshly heart of a sinner and God does his sovereign work and that person is born again. That happened to me many years ago. I've told you the story. I heard the gospel every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. You are lost. You are dead in your sin. Jesus died for your sin. You need to trust him as your savior. If you don't, you go to hell. If you do, you go to heaven. You need Jesus. And I heard it, 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 and I could recite it. I could tell you what the guy was going to say before he ever said it. And then one day... All of a sudden, I don't know how, the wind of the gospel hit me in the face. And all of a sudden, I said, I am a sinner and I'm in desperate need of Jesus. And I believed. Now, why was that different than the 25, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 times before that? Why? The Spirit of God opened my heart to believe. The gospel blew, <laughs> and there it was. How can these things be? Did Nicodemus ever get it? Two years later in John chapter 7, Nicodemus, who's still a Pharisee, still on the Sanhedrin, actually made a point of order in favor of Jesus Guess what happened to him? He got criticized for it. John 19, after Jesus had been crucified, Nicodemus joins up with Joseph of Arimathea, who at this time was a follower of Jesus, though a, a, a fearful one. And they asked for the body of Jesus. That was a very bold act. So what happened? What happened? that caused Nicodemus to say, I don't get it, Jesus. What's it mean to be born again to the place where he's asking to bury the body of Jesus and he's a follower of Jesus? What happened? He was born again. Something changed his heart. It was the Spirit of God. He's born again. What about the rest of the story of Nicodemus? We don't know. It's not written except for tradition. And you know that tradition sometimes... We never know for sure if it's accurate. But let me suggest to you that this is a very strong possibility. This could have happened. Tradition says that um, Nicodemus was the only person who stood up, stood up at Jesus' trial before Pilate, defending Jesus. Tradition says that Peter and John baptized Nicodemus after Jesus ascended into heaven. And that led to losing his position as teacher of the law and being deprived of his entire fortune and banished from Jerusalem by the Sanhedrin to live in abject poverty. The story is told that his daughter was so poor that she was digging in the dung piles for pieces of grain to eat and survive. A rabbi came by and saw her, and he felt compassion on her. And he said, who are you? And she said, I'm the daughter of Nicodemus. And the rabbi said, whatever happened to your father? And she said, he became a follower of Jesus and was banished. And the rabbi refused to help her. Centuries later, reference was made to an ancient document that recorded that Nicodemus was martyred in the first century for his devotion to Jesus. Beaten to death by a mob. 
If any of this is even close to being true, he lost everything in the world, but he gained everything in the world to come. Unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But if he is, he does. How are we born again? The Bible really doesn't give us steps. Follow these three things. It basically says one thing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess you could sort of boil it down to this. You ask. When God begins to do a work in our heart, not only do we know that he is the Savior, but we know that we need a Savior. When the Spirit of God starts to do a work in our heart, we realize we're sinners and we're in desperate need of, of a Savior. And when we realize we're sinners, do you know what we do? We confess. And we're not going to confess to one to whom we do not believe. And so when God does a work in our heart, like the wind, it comes, we don't know how, when, where, it comes and we're changed and we cry out to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we realize that he is a savior who can save to the uttermost. And so we believe the gospel and he changes us. And we're born again. And we're fit for the kingdom of heaven. Not because of who we are, but because of what he has done. We ask. No formula. No steps. John Newton illustrates for us what Jesus was talking about. James Boyce describes the story of Newton this way. He said, Newton was raised in a Christian home when he was, where he was taught verses of the Bible. But his mother died when he was only six years old. He was sent to live with a relative who hated the Bible and who mocked Christianity. So John Newton ran away to sea. He was wild in those years and actually was known for being able to swear for two hours without repeating himself. There's a mark of <laughs> achievement. He was forced to enlist in the British Navy, but he deserted and was captured and beaten publicly as a punishment. Eventually, Newton became a merchant marine and went to Africa. In his memoirs, he wrote that he went to Africa for only one reason, that I might, might sin my fill. Newton fell, into, fell in with a Portuguese slave trader in whose home he was cruelly treated. The man often went away on slaving the, 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 this man, his, his, his uh, one who was taking care of him or, or allowing him to live there. This man often went away on slaving expeditions, and when he was gone, his, his power passed to his African wife, who was... Uh, chief woman of the harem. She hated all white men and vented her hatred on Newton. He says that for months he was forced to grovel in the dirt, eating his food from the ground like a dog. He was beaten mercilessly. If he touched the food, beaten. In time, thin and emaciated, Newton made his way to the sea where he was picked up by a British ship making its way up the coast of England. When the captain of the ship learned that the young man knew something about navigation as a result of being in the British Navy, he made him a ship's mate. But even then, Newton fell into trouble. One day, when the captain was ashore, Newton broke out the ship's supply of rum and got the, tr the crew drunk. He was so drunk himself that when the captain returned, he struck him on the head. Newton fell overboard and would have drowned if, not, if one of the sailors hadn't hauled him back in on board. Near the end of that voyage, one, one voyage... As they were approaching Scotland, the ship ran into bad weather and was blown off course. Water poured in and the ship began to sink. Newton was set down, sent down into the hole to pump water. The storm lasted for days. He was terrified, sure that the ship would sink and, he was, and that he would drown. In the hold of the ship, as he desperately pumped water, the God of all grace whom he had tried to forget but who had never forgotten him, brought to his mind those Bible verses he had learned as a little kid. The way of salvation opened up to John Newton, and he was born again, totally transformed. 
Not long after this, he went away to study theology and eventually became a preacher. His story is contained in these words, and you've sung them many times. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Newton was born again. How did that happen? Spirit of God, like the wind, opened his heart. He believed the gospel. Maybe some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm lost. I'm afraid I won't get to the kingdom of, of God. What do I do? What do I do? You ask, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I have no hope. But Jesus died. I believe he died for me. We trust him. And we're born again. It's that simple. It's not something you do. It's something he does in us. Sometimes we weren't looking, sometimes we weren't thinking about it, and he brings circumstances on us that cause us to cry out to him. The Bible talks a lot about the working of God in our hearts, but he also makes reference to, the, to our response to him. Who will God cast out? None who come to him. And ultimately, those who come to him are those he draws to him. It all works together. It's a mystery. I don't understand it. I don't get it all. It's the wind. It's like the wind. If you are born again today, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, it's because God changed your heart. It's because God made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that's why we rejoice. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. We're going to sing the song Amazing Grace in just a minute. If God is doing a work in your heart today, he might be. And, and you're, you want some more instruction, more, you want somebody to pray with you, you want, you want some encouragement, there'll be some people up in front after church to talk with you or you can talk to me at the door. Um, I don't know when and how and where God does his work, but he works. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for including the story of Nicodemus because Nicodemus is a lot like some of us. A little bit afraid, but also really confused. And even when he got the answer, he still didn't quite understand it. Because ultimately it's not about intellect. It's about your Holy Spirit. It's about your work of cleansing us and making us into the kind of people that are fit to enter the kingdom of heaven, not because of what we do, but because you are willing and able to cleanse us from sin. Oh, dear God, thank you for opening my heart a long time ago. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a new life. And I would assume that those in this room who belong to you are likewise, even at this moment, expressing their gratefulness that they belong to you. And they're so, so, so grateful that you saved them. If there are people here who do not know you, may you open their heart to believe today. Thank you for the amazing grace that was demonstrated and fact shown to us in the sacrifice that Jesus made. As we sing that, may we worship you and give you thanks for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name.